Well, this morning, um, moms, this is no disrespect to you because we love you, but the Lord has laid another message on my heart. It has to do, believe it or not, with um, kind of the, I guess you could say, the spirit of, 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 of motherhood and being a mother. Because what do mothers do almost better than anyone else? Everything. <laughs> would, it, would, it be faith, would, would it be fair to say that mothers are the ultimate servants? Right? I mean, they serve their families and they serve them well. And, um, you know, so hats off to you moms. But today, I'm going to be continuing my series in the book of John. And um, today, let's bow in a word of prayer before we talk about money, talents, and the mission of Christ. Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We know, Lord, that you have plans for your people. And God, you know exactly what we need before we even pray. So this morning we ask you, Lord, that you would open our spirit to hear what you would say to us through your word. We thank you for the book of John and the the richness that we find there, Lord, the depth of understanding that you proclaim through your word to us, Lord. And Father, I just pray for each person here today that, that we'd be able to take a hold of what it is that, that you're uh, going to teach us, Lord, through your word, and take it home with us and, and put it into practice. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and I pray for strength to be able to um, preach this message in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So our text today is in John chapter 2 verses 13 to 22, and we're continuing on in the book of John. We'll be preaching the book of John over the coming months and uh, into the book of Acts. So we're going to be here in this series for quite a while. But to be true to what he was trying to accomplish by writing his gospel, um, the Apostle John continues to lay out the foundation for what he had come to understand concerning the nature and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the first chapter of John, we see that John lays out the fact that Jesus Christ was not just a mere man, but actually Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, who had come into the world to be the living Word of God, to show us who God was like in a very tangible and real way. God, you, you might say, uh, in the flesh, in human form, right? Right? So God, God, uh, Jesus was fully God and fully man, and, and, and the Apostle John uses the, the Baptist's testimony, John the Baptist's testimony, to explain why Jesus, in fact, is the promised Messiah, and um, how the Lord was very much interested and concerned with humanity to the point where he offered himself to meet the deepest needs of the human race. So now John's established the identity of Jesus in the first part of his gospel. And um, then he moves into what we see happening in John chapter 2 with the first of, uh, of many miracles that Jesus had performed with turning the water into wine. And uh, we talked last week quite extensively about what the spiritual significance of that was, so I won't get into that, but um, needless to say, Jesus supplies what is needed to satisfy the thirst of a thirsty people that are parched and needing the waters of life. And and this whole miracle really gets into that and what it means uh, for salvation to us. So, John wanted very much to introduce this to show who the Messiah was and what his purpose in coming to the world was. And now, it's interesting, when you look at the book of John, it's not in sequence the way that some of the other synoptic synoptic gospels are as far as what happens next. The next thing that Jesus talks about, interestingly, is the last public appearance that he makes a, a statement in public, where he goes into the Jewish temple 
And he ends up seeing things that are there that are very concerning to him. And he ends up acting on those things. So, huh, the Jewish leadership of the day, they expected the Messiah to act a certain way and to come on to the world stage in a certain manner. And they expected that the Messiah was going to come into Jerusalem and he's going to be a leader who would fully support what they were doing, first of all, and also that he would come for a political purpose to rise up and to liberate all of them from the Roman oppression that they were facing. So they were expecting the Messiah to do this, but rather than coming, you see, rather than coming into Jerusalem to bring revolution on the political stage, Jesus came to bring revolution on another kind of stage, on the spiritual stage. So from Jesus' first miracle, we fast track towards his last public action before the cross. And God has this sown into the book of John for a very important reason. We're going to talk about that today. If you would turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to John chapter 2, starting with verse 13. We're going to have it on the slide here as well, so you can follow along the slide. So let's start reading from verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now to put all of this in context, this event that we jump into, that John tells the story of, okay, in context, happened just after Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now if you recall what happened on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, and people were crying out aloud, Hosanna, Hosanna. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. That's what they're saying. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. People praised God and laid down their cloaks and palm branches as Jesus rode into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the ancient prophecy of the coming Messiah in Zechariah chapter 9, 9, which states, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. And just before that, we see Jesus had accomplished something that was impossible. He raised a man named Lazarus who, Lazarus who had been dead in a tomb for four days from the dead. So the people knew what had happened. And they were expecting Jesus to come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to rise up as the Messiah to become who they thought he should be. But rather than coming and making his respectful appearance and gathering the troops around him and getting and kind of bolstering the religious leaders and everything that was going on, we see Jesus go directly to the temple, to Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And here he creates a scene. See, I think... When we read the scriptures, it's always good for us to understand what's taking place in the context of what we're reading. Now, at this time, in the setting of this, this act that Jesus performed here, people were preparing for the Passover feast. And this was the celebration where people celebrated the deliverance of Israel from Egypt 
And we know the story of how the blood of the lamb over the doorpost uh, was placed there. The sacrificial lamb was, was offered and the doorposts were, were, were um, brushed with the blood of the lamb and the, the angel of death passed over all who had the blood of the lamb applied to the threshold of their houses. That, that's the Passover, right? So the Israelites celebrated the Passover um, every year and as the Passover time presented, the expectation that people would sacrifice lambs um, began to build. Why? Because people came from all over the land into Jerusalem during the Passover feast and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This was a huge deal. It was enormous. And this is the setting where Jesus comes into the temple. You see, sometimes we get the wrong picture of, of what this temple was like. Maybe in Sunday school we saw a picture in a book or a teacher explained it to us and we had a little felt board like when you're old like me. You know, little felt figures on there in a little temple. And you know, we get this story and we kind of have this context. Everybody brings their own context into the scriptures. And sometimes we think, well, yeah, the temple is kind of like our church, only a little bit bigger, you know. Okay. It's important for us to understand the context of what happened here. Okay. There wasn't just a couple of sacrifices occurring on the Passover uh, celebration week. The Jewish temple was not just a building, the core of it, the most holy place and the holy of holies, yes, it was a building. But the temple encompassed a giant courtyard, what you see now where the Dome of the Rock is on there. Josephus, the, uh, one of the Jewish historians who wrote about everything in that day, he was a, he was a contemporary of the, the first century uh, believers, he wrote about the traditions of the Jews and, and everything. And, and, and he, he said that you could fit 75,000 people in the temple facilities. And it wasn't just a couple of lambs that were brought to be slain. Now, the Passover lamb was a little bit different of how they did that than the regular sacrifices, but... They said that Jerusalem, during the Passover season in the first century, during Jesus' time, would swell to the population of about two and a half million people. As people from all of the nations surrounding um, this, this area would come together, Jews from everywhere came there. And when they came, they came as travelers, and it's not like you'd just grab your pickup truck and you'd haul your own things there. Okay. There was this Passover lamb that needed to be sacrificed in honor of the Passover way back when, when Egypt released Israel from captivity. Right? And I think it was in, in A.D. 4, Josephus says that... Um, the Passover celebration resulted in the slaying of 250,000 lambs. It's different than the little felt board, right, with the little lamb and a couple of people, you know. We have this 100-mile context sometimes of what, what occurred there, right? This was grandiose. And guess what? All these people from all over the place, like two and a half million and 250,000 lambs that were needed to the businessman. <laughs> yes! This is time to uh, bring in revenue. This is a time where we can sell lambs to people coming in. And, and not only are they going to buy lambs, because the, the Passover lamb wasn't always slaughtered in the temple. Some of them would go to the temple and have the priests slaughter them for them, and then they'd take the meat back and they'd have Passover feast, and they'd eat that meat, and they'd brush some of the lamb's blood over the doorpost. A lot of the people sacrificed their own lambs and did that, but there was something they did like that for people as a service to the people 
um, as well in the temple. But all this, this, the, these people that flooded the Jerusalem, it was also an opportunity for them to deal with other aspects of sacrificial uh, obligation. So if you wanted to make a sacrifice for sin, or there's different sacrifices that were called for in the, in the law of Moses. So all these people coming in, they wanted to deal with not only the Passover, but also the sacrifices that would have to be offered to obey the law of Moses for them and their families too. So we're not just talking 250,000 lambs, we're talking cattle, sheep, goats. And, you know, like in Leviticus 5-7, there's poor people that were there and, and the poor people that couldn't afford uh, other sacrifices, right? They were allowed to sacrifice uh, doves or pigeons. And in Leviticus 5 Seven, the law of Moses states, anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin. One for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Okay, so, you kind of get the scale of this now? Like, thousands and thousands of sacrifices. And lots and lots of money being changed hands for the people that would raise the livestock for the sacrifices. And, and, and it goes even further than that, you see, because all these people from all the different lands would bring their money to the temple. And, and, and if you wanted to go into the temple and offer a sacrifice, in Herod's temple, they called for a temple tax. So you'd have to pay a temple tax. But you couldn't just take your American dollar bill or your Canadian dollar bill or whatever it was of that day, your Caesar coin, you know, whatever, and drop that in the temple treasury. No. Anything with the graven image of a man on it or any kind of idol, you know, and in those days they were all worshipping the pantheon and there's different things that they were worshipping. So there's stamps on these coins that were considered unholy and not proper to be placed in the treasury of the temple. So they would have to take... Uh, the money of their where, that they brought from home, and they'd have to exchange it at a money exchange. And that money exchange, they'd have to, uh, they had a certain kind of shekel and half shekel that were considered pure money that could be dropped into the, the, the offering box or the, the, the tithing offering boxes in the, the temple for the temple tax. And it was only these shekels that would be used for that. So they called them um, shekels. That's the Jewish currency, right? And so these certain shekels, all the money had to be exchanged for that. So there was a great deal of money exchange that went. And of course, you guys know about money exchanges? What do they always do to you if you exchange money? There's a fee, right? They're not doing this for free. Again, the businessmen are going, ha, 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 thousands and thousands of people coming into our little place to do business. Ha, ha. Time to make lots of money, lots and lots of money. So where was all this money exchange going to take place? And where were all these sacrifices going to be sold? Well, you could probably do it in other places, but... To the religious leaders of the day to keep things kind of tight to where the, the sacrifices were being offered and where the money was being exchanged because it would really benefit them to get into this, get into this business, right? What better place to have it than actually in the temple itself? But, okay, let's look at, uh, let's look at this. Um, there's a, a slide of the Temple of Herod. Okay, this is Herod's temple. Now, up here you have the building, right? That's the holy place, the most holy place. That's where the, the curtain in the temple was and where the Ark of the Covenant was to be behind there at the time. Um, it was just a place where, where only the high priest could go one time per year to, to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And then outside of that, there was, uh, there was other places, you know, where there'd be a temple, of sh where there'd be showbread. And anyways, only priests could enter the holy place. Not a good place to, to sell animals for sacrifices, right? No. Okay, so then you have, outside of the main building of the temple, 
you have courtyards. And this isn't the scale, by the way. It's a lot bigger than this. This is kind of shrunk down so that you can see it in a, in a picture. But you have, you have courts. There's four different courts. There's the court of, uh, of the priests. And then that, that would be right in here. Only priests could enter there. Only Levites could enter there. Not a good place to sell animals or to exchange money. Um, then you'd have the court of men. So if men had gone through their purification ceremonies properly and, and were ceremonial, ceremonially pure before God, the men could come into this one court. Um, they were able to, uh, to worship the Lord there. Jewish men would, were allowed. Joint Gentiles weren't allowed in there. Even like ladies weren't allowed in there. This is for, for uh, the priesthood of the family, I guess you could say. So there's this. That's not a good place either. The court of women, um, where the men and women could come together um, if they were ceremonially pure, and, and they would be kind of on one side here. The court of men's on one side. The, the court of women on the other side. Women and their families could come, where the men could come together. Very small. We're talking thousands of sacrifices and thousands of, uh, or a million, maybe, I don't know how much money would exchange there. No, that's not going to work either. So those three courts on the inner part of the temple were no good. What's left in the temple? It's this right here. All this area on the outside of the three inner courts was the outer court of the temple. And that court was also called the court of the Gentiles. Now, if you were a merchant or you were a money changer and you had animals and you had solid stone, level ground, and you could actually pay the priests or the, the, the religious leaders for a spot to set up your booth in there, that would be most advantageous to you, wouldn't it, to make money? If you were selling sacrifices or if you were exchanging money, the better seats you get, the better money you make. So this is what was happening. You see? The court of the Gentiles, of course, perfect. It was the largest court in the temple. Why was it the largest? Because there are more Gentiles in the world than there are Jews. The court of the Gentiles was the outermost court and was the only area of the temple where non-Jews were allowed to go to worship God. As its name implies, the court of Gentiles, accessible to Gentiles, foreigners, and those who were considered not ceremonially, ceremonially clean enough to get into the inner courts. Consider what God says in Isaiah about Gentiles who follow him. In Isaiah 56, 6 and 7 we read, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations." But instead of being a house of prayer for all nations, what had happened was the practicality of selfish interests of the religious leadership of the day used the house of prayer for all nations as a currency exchange and as a place to make money on sacrifices being sold for the Passover sacrifices. It was sanctioned by the leadership. In Isaiah 42.6, God gave Israel a very clear mission. In this passage, God tells the Israelites, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you. I will make you to be a covenant for the people and what? A light for the Gentiles. It was God's design that Israel be an ambassador nation to the world for him. But sadly, 
many did not catch that vision. The Gentiles were no concern to some of these leaders in Herod's temple during Jesus' time. The Gentiles weren't a concern to them. The Gentiles were unclean. So many Jews thought them to be generally unimportant to God. And henceforth, they were to be avoided. And salvation for them was of little to no concern. Who really cared if the sacrifices and the money exchange was in the court of the Gentiles? Now to be fair, there was ceremonial law forbidding Jews to intermarry with Gentiles. They were not to have business arrangements with the Gentiles. They were to come out from that culture and be separate from them. But nowhere in Scripture is it stated that the Gentiles are not important to God. As it is today, some of the religious people of Jesus' day embraced a theology that was very mixed up. And they got the wrong idea. See, God didn't want them to be involved with Gentile culture because belief systems of the Gentiles were contaminated with practices of idol worship and idolatry. And what they failed to realize in this setting was that it wasn't the actual flesh of the Gentile that was the problem. It was the spirit of the Gentile's idolatry that was the problem. So purging close associations with Gentiles was done so that spiritual contamination would not negatively affect a person's relationship with God. And it was certainly possible for Gentiles to become believers and followers of the Lord if they humbled themselves before God, as we read in the Scripture. These people were called proselytes. And this is what the temple court of the Gentiles was made for. A special place made for those who decided that they would give up their worship of idols and their following after doctrines of demons and would come to serve the Lord God Almighty, the one true creator of the heavens and the earth, of whom Israel was the ambassador God's temple was to be a place where people of all nationalities could come and pray and offer sacrifices to the Lord without any interference. So we see in our text in John, now you kind of get the context. We see Jesus entering the temple with great expectation by the people that he would make his respectful appearance and start this movement of political change. But then the Lord does something completely different that nobody expected him to do. They expected him to enter the temple to pay his respects and maybe make a speech or make some sort of proclamation concerning his plans for the future. But instead, he does what John describes in the next segment of our text. You see, Jesus got angry. Yes, even Jesus gets angry sometimes. There's five instances recorded in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where Jesus gets really upset. He gets angry. He was angry, for instance, for those who refused to let, to, to, who refused to acknowledge the fact that he was helping someone with a crippled, shriveled hand on a Sabbath day. Very, that upset him greatly. He got angry with his disciples for believing that the children that were brought to him were second-class citizens. It made him angry. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven as adults are more important than children. That got him angry. Jesus got angry. In this case, for people who turned his temple into a den of robbers, taking away the opportunity for the Gentiles to draw nearer to God. 
So rather than pay his respects as they were expecting him to do, John tells us that Jesus, the Messiah, spoke up and acted upon the corruption he saw in the religious system of the day. From verse 15 of our text we read, So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. You see, what enraged Jesus the most here was that religion which was supposed to bring people close to God had become corrupted by selfish ambitions and personal enrichment desires. This kind of temple kept outsiders out of the pathway of salvation. Gentiles who were lost in the darkness of idolatry and sin and demonic oppression were pushed away. They were pushed out, treated with indifference, and turned off by the way they were treated. Turned away from the message of God. All of this was done by the ones who were truly called to be a light, pointing the way to the Lord. The Jews responded to him, 18, and when it says the Jews, we're not talking about the race. We're talking about the leaders of this thing going on here. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body after he was raised from the dead. His disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. My dear friends, The scriptures here points to another issue that is resident within the religious heart if we are not careful. This is not just a story of that past day. It is a story of the past day to reveal a problem in the human heart that needs desperately to be looked out for and avoided. And if we're not careful, we'll get swallowed up in the same sin as that of the religious leaders of that day. Jesus rightly described himself as God's temple. He really did. Because Jesus was God in the flesh, and he walked in the power of God's indwelling spirit. Remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him? In in John chapter 133, we're going to step back into that. And I myself, John said, did not know him not knowing that he's the Messiah, for sure. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus was God in the flesh, and he had the power to lay his life down, and he had the power to take it up again. He has the power to save the soul, heal the sick, mend the heart, Jesus Christ has power to give mankind the very access to the throne room of God. And you see, as human beings, we are made in the image of God. Inside us are three parts. A most holy place in the center of our being. Our spirit was made to be a place for God to dwell. However, that place cannot be dwelt in by the Holy Spirit until the inner sanctuary is cleansed. This is what the sacrifice of Jesus does when his sacrificial blood that was shed on the cross for us is applied to the mercy seat of our spirits under the new covenant, our sins are forgiven. We are cleansed and we become an acceptable place for the Holy Spirit to dwell. And when we submit to the Lord and we ask him to be our Savior, he becomes our great high priest. This is all great news. This is awesome news. Jesus becomes our great high priest. 
His blood is applied to our lives. And we're forgiven. We're justified, made just as if we had never sinned. And then we become a temple that the Holy Spirit takes residence within. Hebrews 10, 14-18 says this, for, one, for by one sacrifice He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For he's, first He says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we're justified by the precious blood of Jesus. The temple veil is torn in two and we have access to the very throne of God as believers in Jesus Christ. As followers of Him. However, God doesn't just want to dwell within the inner court. or Sorry, the most holy place. He doesn't just want to dwell in that place. But He wants to be dwelling in our entire being and our entire being to be consecrated or sanctified. Sanctification is consecrated for service, holy service to the king. As that scripture said, we're being made holy. There's a process in play where God wants to make us holy and consecrated for service to the king of kings. Because our entire body, not just our spirit, is the house of God. That includes our soul and our body. It's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. And I repeat it again. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You see, our soul is the inner courts of our temple and it's comprised of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And our body is like the outer courts of the temple on which our physical actions through our speech and our activities, get this, either draw people on the outside, the Gentiles of this world, it either draws them to come and worship the Lord or it turns them off and turns them away from the Lord. You see, when we become true followers of Jesus Christ, we become a temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. And that's not just our spirit, but also our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, and our physical bodies. We come to recognize that our lives, our talents, our resources, they are not our own. They are purchased with a price. They belong to the Lord. We do not own our own self. We do not have title to our being any longer. We belong to the Lord. Our lives were saved and purchased at a price, at a cost that was so dear to God. Jesus spilled his blood to make at one to bring us to be at one with our Lord. And he made it possible. And this is why the scriptures tell us in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through sanctification to be made holy and useful for the Lord and His kingdom. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, praise the Lord. Sanctification, that process where we're formed into vessels to be used by God for His holy purposes. God doesn't just want to save you to sit there. God wants to save you to be used for his holy purposes. And what is his holy purpose? To take the gospel to the world that is dying, to the Gentiles that are lost in their sins, who need salvation, deliverance, and healing from the God, from the God of heavens. That's the mission of the church. That's the mission of God. And when you become saved, you are no longer your own, but you become part of this mission. And God has a place for you in this mission. And if you're not fulfilling the mission that God has for you, God wants to change that. He wants to change that. Remember, the, out of the five cases in the earthly ministry of Jesus, what made Jesus angry? 
I would say beyond anger, there was sorrow. When Jesus went into Jerusalem, he knew what he was walking into. He, he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! And he saw how they would, they would be unraveled because they would reject him. He knew it. See, one of the biggest things that makes God angry is when instead of his temple is used, instead of his temple being used as a place that is consecrated and a place of prayer and communion and service to him, his temple is desecrated. And in this particular case, when Jesus came into the temple, the temple was desecrated by greed. When a spirit of greed enters the courts of his temple, those who have greed in their hearts do not have the mind of the Holy Spirit. A person controlled by greed still tries to control their own lives. They still say that this is my life. I'll do what I want to do. Rather than understanding that as a blood-bought saint of Christ, your life is not your own any longer. It's not up to me what I do with my own life. It has everything to do with what God wants to do with my life and what he calls me to do with my life. Instead of, our, of souls of the lost being our treasure, the soul of the lost are the last things on some believers' minds. They're pushed out of mind and out of our priority. We're so quick to judge the Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law for allowing this to happen in Herod's temple. But we're reluctant to look at our own hearts and admit that the same seed of sin can, sin can reside in the temple that is us. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This message of the temple is not just for the temple of the ancient days. This message is for the temple of God here and now. And I'm telling you right now that this guy is a temple of the spirit of the living God and so are you if you are a true believer in Jesus. And it's time for us to get serious about consecration to the Lord. The time is short. There is not much time left. People are going to hell in a handbasket because the people of God are so consumed with what they're doing in their temple as if it's theirs. They're building their, their, their portfolio. To honor the Lord with your life means honoring God with your spirit, your whole life, and the actions of your body. Do we do this perfectly? No, we don't. God, have mercy on us. We need his grace to be able to do this. The Lord would have me speak with you some truth here to today. We can desecrate God's temple, it's true, by, by the sins of the flesh, yielding to immoral behaviors or, or you know, things like immorality, sexual immorality, and, and drunkenness. And, and, and we can desecrate and the temple of God by coveting what our neighbor has and what we don't have, being jealous about that. or We can have malice or unforgiveness in our hearts. And our pride most definitely needs to be surrendered to Christ. But this morning, the context of this passage is focused on another sin that causes many to be ineffective and unproductive in their life and witness for Jesus Christ. And that sin is greed. What Jesus did in Herod's temple was God showing us what he thinks about a life that is greedy, living only for self. Show me where a man or woman invests his time or energy. Show me where a man or woman invests their money. And I will show you where their heart is before the Lord. End quote. This is truth, friends. As a man acts out, that's where his heart is. As a woman acts out, that's a revelation of where her heart is. For, let's ma for that matter, let's go even further with this. You show me where a collective church invests their collective money, 
and their talents and abilities, and you will see where the heart of that church is. The heart of a church is the heart of the people because the people are the church. The building isn't. You are the church. You are the saints of God. God forbid that selfish interests become my chief priority. And I say this because I got fingers pointing at this guy just because I need God's grace in this. In myself, I get sidetracked. I lose priorities. Is the pursuit of the almighty dollar for ourselves more important than the mission of God's eternal kingdom? I'm going to ask you that question. This is where the rubber meets the road with the gospel, folks. What are we doing? I thank the Lord every day for people who are investing in, this, in, this, in, in the work of Christ through Hillside. There are so many people in this assembly that are investing their time and their abilities and their talents and their finances. Thank you for serving the Lord with this. But I'm telling you right now, <laughs> We could do so much more if everyone got on board. So much more. Okay, God takes care of us. He really does, miraculously. Since the inception of, of this church, God has done miraculous things to intervene. All the time. Okay, I had a miracle happen this week, a financial miracle. The people who who felt the Lord leading him, didn't even know what I was facing. As you See, I'm a pastor as a shepherd, but I'm also an administrator. And, and I have administrative responsibilities in this church that many people don't even understand. Today, I got a, or this week, I got an impromptu visit from both the health inspector, well, not an impromptu visit from the health inspector, it was planned, but at the same time the health inspector came here, the fire inspector came. The same time. Oh, my. Oh, you want to talk stress? And, and not only that, but these people were very good at their jobs. <laughs> they were very good. There was no stone left unturned. And yes, last Saturday we had a men's breakfast. And yes, our smoke alarm is right outside the kitchen, as many of you know. And yes, the bacon sets off the alarm. <laughs> Every time. So we shut the alarm off before men's breakfast and we turn it back on at the end of men's breakfast. Guess who didn't turn the alarm back on? Yeah. So the fire inspector comes and the first thing he sees is dead batteries on the emergency lighting system. Not just one, all of them. Further to that, you guys know our history. Many of you do know our history. That for, for a number of years, we were on a shoestring budget trying, just trying to keep the lights on here because we didn't have enough people or enough giving to, to take care of things properly. So a lot of stuff needs upgrading because it just wears out. So he went through the entire system, and there's a list as long as my arm of things that we need to take care of. And honestly, I want it to be a safe place for everybody. Because yeah, people are more important than facilities even, right? So inwardly, I just I felt downhearted. I was like, oh my goodness. And something I didn't realize, you see, because my wife had to go off with the health inspector. I started with the health inspector, and then the fire chief came in, and, or the fire inspector came in, and I'm like, okay, you deal with the health inspector, I'll deal with the fire inspector. So she had another set of things that were happening alongside of that, and I got the report from the fire inspector, or from the health inspector. You know what the health inspector says? Guess what? You're doing really well in this, this, and this area, but you fail in this area. <laughs> you fail in this area, and you fail in this area. And one of the areas was, we want you to replace all the countertops here because they're cracked, and the wood soaks in bacteria. So we need this done. And I'm like, okay, with all the things, with this big list from the fire marshal and all this thing from the, from the uh, health inspector, 
And I'm looking in my head like, this is thousands of dollars. You know, I didn't even have a chance to ruminate on this. And somebody came, and I'm not going to tell you who it is because that's not important. Somebody came in obedience to Christ and said to me, I don't know why, but I feel like we're supposed to give. And I'm not even going to tell you how much was given. But it was more than what would normally be given. <laughs> this is, I hadn't even finished my meeting yet. I had a Bible study to teach, so I had to tell the fire chief, can you finish off with my wife or the fire inspector? And this happened during my Bible study issue times. Something like this came up. You know something? God takes care of us. He takes care of us. But my friends, how does God take care of us? He takes care of us through you. That person had no idea what had just transpired in my administrative world. And yet they were obedient to Christ because the Holy Spirit laid it on their heart. And I'm not saying this to bolster that person. I'm saying that this is how the body of Christ should operate, daily operate. You see, when our relationship with Christ becomes a place that is self-centered, and my place in the church is about enriching me personally, but does little to reach lost brothers and sisters or to build the kingdom of God here we have a problem. There's a problem in Houston. You see, to the extent that the believer, every believer in Christ, gives themselves to service as God's vehicle of expression, to that extent, that church will be effective. That church will be blessed. The bottom line is that the blessing of God in our lives, folks, and our church, because we are the church, is contingent upon our willingness to be a consecrated place to the service of the Lord. And I'm talking individual temples here. Is your temple consecrated to God or has it been desecrated by greed? Our church leadership, I'm part of that, is collectively responsible with what we've been given materially in both finances and talents. We're responsible for the Lord, before the Lord, to further the mission of the church. And we are going to have to give an account for what we do with that. I take that very, very seriously. And have I always done exactly the right thing with that? No. But I pray that I would be. And I pray that our leadership team would be. We have to give an answer to the Lord for the proper appropriation or misappropriation of the funds that are entrusted to us. But at the end of the day, my friends, it's the individual temple, the living stone that is built upon the foundation of Christ and the apostles that is responsible for partnering with the Holy Spirit in funding the mission and supplying the talent for serving God's kingdom purposes where he has place. Where he has placed us. See, You're not in some other place. You're here. And you have a responsibility before God. That's what this miracle is all about. Or this, this, I guess it would not be a miracle. It's a confrontation. It's all about wrong priorities in the temple. And I'm saying right now, some of 
us need to repent because we've been selfish at the exclusion of the Gentiles. Do you know what we could do? What we could do if everyone tithed 10% of their income for the kingdom of God, I'm not talking about increasing staff wages, but it would be nice to be able to afford another staff member to assist me as we grow. Yep, that's right. It would be. And that's not fleshly. That is spiritual. Do you know how many missions we support right now? We support seven missionaries. That's awesome. Wouldn't it be nice if we supported 27? Wouldn't it be nice if Wycliffe Bible translators receive three, four, five, seven, ten times as much from us that they're receiving now so that scriptures can go into the hands of people that don't know Jesus? Wouldn't it be nice if we could support triple, quadruple, whatever, our giving to the Bible college that's training leaders in Thailand who have no access to training for pastors outside of beachheads that we're supporting for that purpose. Villages of hope in Africa. We're supporting a mission right now that's, that's caring for over 3,000 orphans in Africa. Wouldn't it be nice if we could tenfold our support of them? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just take care of our mortgage so that we could expend God's funds in the kingdom work because it's the last time? Folks, this isn't going to happen from somebody else. This is going to happen from you being invested in the kingdom of God. I'm not here to browbeat you. I'm speaking to you the word of the Lord. You see, the human heart has this problem of greed and selfishness. It always has and it always will. My heart, unbridled, is selfish and looks to my own interests. It is. Just the way it is. That's our sin nature, isn't it? All of us. What does the scripture say now that we're believers? That our interests are not just our own anymore. They should be the Lord's interests. In the Jewish spectrum during times where there was apostasy, God spoke through Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3, and I'm just going to end with this, folks. Malachi chapter 3, 7 to 12. See, this human heart issue has a problem. And God called Israel to repentance. It's written, God wrote this to Israel back in Malachi. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will you, a mere mortal, rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much of a blessing that there will be not even enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your field will not drop their fruit before it is ripe says the Lord Almighty. Then all of the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Bringing it down, folks, in ending here, to the new covenant relationship we have with God. No, we're not bound under the law of Moses. It's true. 
But the principles of the law of Moses point to a greater principle. And that is that no longer am I just to tithe a little bit of me and a little bit of what I am and have. I'm to give God everything. I'm not saying give God, sell your house and you know, that's not what this is about. That's not what it's about. It's about understanding that God has given you everything you are and have and that you are responsible as a steward of that to give back to him what is rightfully his. Why? Because he chooses to partner with you in the gospel. God didn't have to use his disciples to feed the multitudes in the miracle of the loaves and fishes. He doesn't have to use me to preach the gospel from this pulpit. He doesn't have to use you to reach your neighbor for Christ, to share your faith, to give the gift that you give to his kingdom purpose. He doesn't have to. He can make plates of food fall down from heaven and land in front of the people that are hungry. He can speak from a donkey as well as he can from me if he so chooses. If we don't praise the Lord, the rocks will cry out. He is God and we are not. He does not need us or our gifts. He doesn't need it. But He asks us to come into partnership with Him and use what He has given to us to further His kingdom purposes. He wants us to walk with the miracle of transformed lives. And as a temple of the Holy Spirit... Your priorities are going to determine how the church is going to go because you are the church. So, friends, this is a heavyweight sermon for Mother's Day. I know it is. But this is what God laid on the plate. And I believe God's speaking to me and he's speaking to you about stewardship and about doing the right thing for the right reason. Why? Not because the pastor is browbeating, but because I love Jesus, and I want to see those people out there saved. I want to see those orphans clothed and given an education and a home. I want to see the pastor trained for that town. I want to see Bibles come into the hands of kids. I I want to see Hillside Community Church and the other churches in 100 Mile flourish and be able to do things that will make a big impact in this community for Christ. Oh, that's what it's all about. It's about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what it's about. If we have that priority in mind, God will lead us and he'll show us what we're to do. But we can't be like the religious leaders of that day who look at the blessing of God as a business venture and as a way to rub your hands together and go, hey, I can build something here for myself. That's not what it's about. If we have that, we need to repent. We need to repent, 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 repent. Fall on our face before God, like one of the kids is saying here, and say, I'm sorry, Lord. It's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. Keith Green said it well. I make my life a prayer to you. I only want to do what you want me to. Is that your prayer today? I pray that it is. This is food for thought. We've got decisions to make. I would, I would encourage you to make the decision that is right before God. Amen. May his kingdom come. May his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, here in 100 miles. Worship team.